As I mentioned in last week's video, I quickly went over uh, three different options for lightweight web browsers. Obviously, there are fuller ones out there, such as Apache and others, but if you want a quick and simple to set up for a web server with software that is probably already installed on your system, there are a few options, and today we're going to be looking at BusyBox's HTTPD. Again, BusyBox is a shell environment that has a bunch of tools already built into it, and it's on many systems, and especially lighter weight systems. Uh, and last week I said it's on pretty much every system, and then this week I went to do a tutorial using a Raspberry Pi as a setup, and I go to use it and BusyBox is not installed, although it's in the repositories. So uh, forgive me for that uh, little thing I said that wasn't really true, but it, it will be on most systems, and again, especially lightweight systems, which is probably what you're going to be using this on if you're going to use it. Now, I am logged into a Raspberry Pi here running Raspbian. It's a, uh, besides installing Vim and BusyBox, it's the default install, and I'm just SSH'd into it. So let's go ahead and start setting up a little web server. Now, you can use any folder you want. I'm in the home directory for the user Pi right now. I'm going to make directory for all my web stuff. So I'm just going to create a directory, call it www, but you can call it whatever you'd like. And I'll move into that directory, and I will use Vim or whatever text area you like. I'll create a index.html file, and we'll create an extremely simple hello world file. And we'll save that. Now we could use BusyBox. Let's real quick, as I said, I installed BusyBox using the command um, sudo aptitude install BusyBox. If I could type today. That's the command. I already have it installed, but if you didn't, it takes like 10 or 15 seconds for it to download and install it. Um, so I'm just going to kill that because I already have it installed. I'll clear the screen here and um, now that we have it installed, let's check it out because BusyBox can be compiled with different components. But if you have a full version of BusyBox, it's going to have a lot of tools in it. And if you just type BusyBox, it gives you all that information. And you can see all these tools built into it, and they're alphabetical. So if we looked at H, right here we have HTTPD. So if you have that, you're good to go. We can now set up our web server. I can just type in BusyBox HTTP. D, and that's the command for that server. And uh, let's tell it, well, by default, it's going to use the current directory and the current user and port 80. If I go to do that right now, it's going to give me a permission denied. And that's because most systems won't allow a regular user to use port 80. Now, there's ways around this, uh, you know, giving different users permission to use that. But for this, I'm just going to set up a different port. So I'm going to type in the same thing, BusyBox HTTPD. I'm going to do stash, dash P, and I'm just going to use a higher port. I'll just use 8080. I'll hit enter, and our web server is now up and running on port 8080. If I do ifconfig, I can see that the IP address for this server is 192.168.1.115. So if I go to my web browser, and I type in that IP address along with colon 8080 or whatever port you choose, uh, you're good to go. You can hit enter. If you have it running on port 80, you don't have to tell your web browser what port it is. So I'll hit enter there. And right away it says hello world because it knows that there's an index file in there and it uses that index. Now if we were to rename or move that index file to, we'll just say my.html, it still exists, but if we go up here and refresh, it says file not found. So take into account, as I said last week, by default, HTTPD is not going to create a directory index for you, although you can do that with scripting, which is something we'll get into possibly in the future. Um, but it will automatically look for an index, or you can tell it forward slash and the name of the file, my HTML, there it is. So either use an index to point to different files, or you have you give it the full URL, and that's the same with pretty much all web servers, unless you have it set up to give you a direct index. Now, how do we kill our server? You notice that it's no longer running in the shell down here. Let me bring this up like this. Uh, it's by default, BusyBox's HTTPD gets thrown into the background as a daemon, so it's running as a background process. If you type in PS, UX, and hit enter, you can see right here that it's running, so I can grab its 
PID, its process ID, and just type in kill and its process ID, and now it's killed. If I go back to my web browser here and I try refreshing, it's going to tell me that the web page is not available because the server is turned off. So that's one way that's, you know, the, the basic, basic functionality of this. You know, all we did, the only thing out of the defaults is that we changed the port. So let's give it another option here and let's do dash F and hit enter. What this does is it prevents it from going into the background. As you can see, we can no longer use this shell here because it's running. So I can go back to our web browser and hit F5 to refresh. And there we go, we have our hello world file. So I will now come back down here and since it's running in this shell I can hit control C to kill it and hit F5 up here and you can see now it's gone because I killed it down there so by default it's going to go into the background and let's use the dash F option which will keep it in the foreground F for foreground and um, and that, in that case, you can just use Control C to kill it. Now, another benefit of using the foreground is you can also add to that dash V, which gives it the verbose mode, or I always have trouble saying that. But basically, it gives you a lot more output. So we'll hit Enter. And now, if I hit F5 up here, you can see it tells me that uh, we were connected. It tells what computer connected. So uh, the server is ends in 115, but it's saying here that the computer at 192.168.1.150 is connecting and uh, by default you can see here it responds is 200. 200 uh, means good output so I mean the, it, it served up the web page okay so every time I hit F5 up here it's going to give us a little bit of output there. You also notice it's giving a port number here even though we're connecting to the server on uh, port 8080 there's other interactions with other ports going on here uh, basically where it's returning stuff to. Not going to get into that too much uh, just know that 200 means it's served it up okay. 400 I forget what that means but we all know what a 404 is if I was to type in the name of a URL that does not exist and hit enter, you can see we get a 404 here. So you are getting some sort of output with that uh, verbose uh, turned on. Uh, so you can see real time if there's any problems. It's good for troubleshooting. Again, since we're in the foreground here, I can come back down here and hit control C. And uh, if I come back up here and hit F5, instead of getting a 404 error, we're gonna get this web page is not available because the server is down. Uh, one more thing I'd like to go over today, and we are gonna go over more stuff with HTTP uh, in the coming weeks, um, is that, as I said, by default, it uses whatever directory you are in. So we want to be able to um, tell it what folder to use, sometimes in cases where we're not necessarily in that folder because if I was to go back to my home directory here and run that command well now it's running in that directory and if I try up here you can see I'm getting a file not found for that but I'm also getting a file not found for my my.html because it's no longer looking in the proper directory so how can we tell it to use a certain directory regardless of where we are when we start BusyBox well, we'll hit control C to kill our server there. What we can do is we can do dash H and we can tell it, well, I want you to always run uh, this folder here and give it whatever folder you want. So you can be in any directory on the system, run this, and it will always, this is the root directory for your web server. So I can come back up here, hit F5, and there's our hello world. So now let's, these are just some very basic options we got over today. I have the three servers we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks. Uh, BusyBox's HTTPD is uh, my favorite by far, uh, although there are some other benefits of some of the other options out there. But there's a lot more to this, and it's a nice little lightweight tool that, again, you probably already have installed on your system. If not, you will be able to install it. And again, on a lot of devices, routers, phones, uh, and things such as that nature, probably already have a version of BusyBox on it. And even if they don't have the HTTPD uh, version in there, you can always compile your own and replace the one that's on that system, allowing you to run a basic web server on pretty much any device, as long as you can, you know, get a shell and root access, preferably if, in case you need to do some advanced stuff. So again, 
Let's review BusyBox, HTTP, B, HTTPD, and then whatever port you want. You need special permission if you want to just use port 80, which is the default web server port. Dash F is foreground. You can also do dash V along with that for verbose mode. And dash H is for your home or the root directory of the web server. So whatever you put after that will be the root directory for the web server. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you subscribe. Check out the video next week. If you like this topic, be sure to give the video a like. That helps me out and also allows me to know what you guys are enjoying. Um, and oh, as always, share the video. I would appreciate that. And uh, please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There should be a link in the description to that. Uh, and it's as always, I hope that you have a great day. If you enjoy my tutorials and would like to see more, please think about contributing to my Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. Okay, this is a uh, second part to looking at BusyBox's HTTPD web server. Uh, I hope that you watched last week's video where we set up just a basic server. Today we're actually going to start working with server-side scripting. So if you want to create certain scripts such as Bash scripts or Python scripts or really any scripting or even languages that aren't scripting language, you can run pretty much any program and output the the uh, the output of that program is HTML to create GUIs for your whatever scripts. Uh, so, uh, again, we last week we created a folder called www on my Raspberry Pi. I'm going to go into there and we have one file in there which is an HTML file. Now by default, unless you tell it otherwise, uh, you, we're going to use a, another folder within what would be your web server's root folder, which is this folder here, and that folder will be a CGI-bin, and that's where you'll place any server-side scripts. Now you can change this in a configuration file, which we will talk about in a future video, uh, but by default, all your scripts can go in there, so CGI-bin, and we're gonna go into there. Uh, actually, let's just use Vim and start going in there, and we'll just say inside that folder, let's create a folder called um, my.sh and we'll create a shell script uh, and I will say bin bash because I want it to be a bash script although you know make sure there is bash on your system a lot of cases where you might be using busy boxes HTTPD will be on lighter weight systems such as arm devices uh, phones and routers which could have bash on them but a lot of times they don't uh, so you may want to use the standard sh uh, which in this particular case is not going to make a difference so I'll just do that but you can use bash or whatever script interpreter you want uh, just as long as it's installed on the system now let's go ahead and say echo and again we'll say hello world now we'll save that and we'll make it executable by changing mod plus X so now it's executable I can run that script right here in my shell and you can see it outputs hello world okay great so you think at this point oh I'll just go in and run that on my server so we'll start up the server like we did last time with busybox httpd whatever port in this case port 8080 uh, and we'll say foreground make it verbose and we'll say the home directory is the current directory we're in but it's nice to have that there in case we're accidentally in a different directory we can hit enter and at this point I can go to my web browser I can type in the IP address of my server and if I hit enter we're gonna get uh, you know there's no index file so it's gonna say 404 error there but what I can say at this point is forward slash CGI dash bin forward slash and the name of our script which I already forgot, oh, I think it's my.sh. We'll hit enter and you realize there's no output and no errors. Why is that? Well, although our script is running, it didn't output everything that the web browser is looking for. So what we need to do is we need to give 
just two commands uh, at the beginning of our script. So let's go ahead and kill our web server down here and go back into our script. So I'm gonna, again, use Vim as my text editor, but use whatever text editor you feel comfortable with. And before Hello World, before at the beginning of any script or program that you're running, you're gonna to wanna to type in echo and we're gonna say content dash type colon text HTML. This is telling the web browser, you know, okay, this is a text HTML file. Without that, it doesn't know what to do with it, so it's it's not going to be displaying it properly. And then echo with uh, nothing there, just two quotes, because it, it needs to have the web browser is looking for this, and then an empty line, and then after that, it will start printing out whatever output the script outputs. So we will save that run our web server again, start up our web server, and I'll come up here and hit F5, and there we go, we have hello world. So it's working, great. So control C to kill our server, and I'll vim back into our script, and I'll add another line. I'll say echo, this is a test. Now, if I was to run this script from our shell here, everything looks good, it outputs, you know, our our content type and the empty line that it needs after that. And then we have our hello world and test. Now, those of you who are familiar with HTML, even a little bit, you probably know what's already gonna be wrong with this when you run this, is that HTML web browsers, HTML by default, ignores white spaces and new lines. It has tags for that sort of thing. So if we come up here and hit F5, it outputs the information. It says hello world and this is a test, but all on one line rather than two lines. And if we uh, look at the source code inside our web browser, you can see it is two lines. It's just not designed to be displayed like that in a web browser. So uh, what, all we have to do is add a line break in there. So coming back down here and killing my server, I'm gonna go, and again, you can have two shells open. You don't have to kill the server each time. That's just what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna come in here and I can do this. I can say, uh, put a tag for line break, you know, less than br greater than. I can save that, start up our server again, hit F5, and there they are on this two different lines. Now, the good thing about this is that we can also, you know, save room in our code and actually do all this, whoops, in one command. Doing it like this will, I'll do the same thing. So see, I'm refreshing and it's outputting the same. So let's now uh, start running some actual commands besides just an echo command. So I'm gonna kill our server here. I'm gonna go vim into our shell script here. And I will add in, let's say we wanna display the date. And I can just say date, because that's the date command. Uh, we'll probably wanna put a new line or how about a horizontal break in here. So we'll say HR, which will give us a horizontal line break. Okay, so we'll do that. And, oops, and we will now bring up our web browser again, start up our web server, F5 that, and we got hello world, this is a test, and we got the date output there. And so again, you can generate any type of HTML you want. You can create buttons, uh, you know, headers, whatever, uh, just by adding tags. So let's say we wanted to to add some sort of tag uh, and make that, that date larger, we can make it a, a header tag, which isn't really necessarily the best way to do that, uh, but it's what I'm going to do. So what I can do here is I can say, okay, echo h1 tag, and then after the date command, I can say echo forward slash close the h1 tag. Save that, start our server up, refresh up here, and there you can see the date is larger now. So again, any type of HTML output, which can uh, be, you know, colors, font size, different types of fonts, buttons, uh, iframes, tables, cells, any of that stuff. So you can create any type of HTML GUI for any type of program or script this way, uh, because you can call you can run any type of script or call any type of binary file that you have permission for 
right here. And just remember to put your new lines where you need them and format it as you would an HTML document. So let's control C to kill that and go ahead and here again and we'll say, okay, date. And let's say we want to know a little bit more about the system. We can say uname A. And again, if we run this script from the shell, we get the output, you know, we have the HTML tags here. And of course you can, well, I'm manually putting the HTML tags. There are cases where you'll uh, generate them based on the output of your script. But uh, right here you can see the output it gives the date and time. And we also have information on the system itself, uh, which uh, will be displayed up here. Once I run our web server again using the same command, and we'll hit F5 up here, and there we go. We have this now. We didn't have to put a new line break because headers, uh, the H1 tag already puts a new line break, so that automatically is on another line. And um, that's it. That's it for for basic uh, scripts. But as you can see, you can run anything. And again, oh well, uh, I want to point out that this actually that isn't just it. I do need to explain something very important about this. Uh, one, if any of your scripts are going to get any type of input. You definitely want to be careful about that as with any server. Um, and we may get into that probably in a future tutorial. But um, remember that when I'm starting Busy Back Box as I am right here, it's running as whatever user is starting the server. So in this particular case, it's running it as Pi, which is a regular user uh, and has access to that user's files, among other things. So you probably want to create a special user just for. Um, your web server. When you run something like Apache, it's actually running as a www-data user, or at least in that group, because um, the shell script is running at. So if you were to run this script, let's say you were to uh, use uh, sudo or, or run, login as root, it will be running with those privileges. Uh, which could be very bad if you're allowing you input and in most cases should not be allowed. Now there are certain cases where you will uh, actually be doing that, but you'll take other safety precautions. Uh, but the way you tell it, you either run it as that user or you can use the dash U option, dash U and then type in the username. So user, let's say the username was Bob. I don't have a Bob user on here. So probably again, error. Yeah. So no, no user group name Bob but you would want to use that dash U to say what user you will be uh, starting BusyBox's HTTPD as. But without that, it's starting as whatever user is starting up that server, which can be useful in certain cases, um, especially if you're gonna be creating user interfaces for your system. I'll give you a quick example of that is uh, uh, the distribution Slitaz, if I'm pronouncing that properly. I've talked about it many times, it's a very lightweight, um, user interface and they have uh, basically their control panel is a web interface using BusyBox and it is running uh, uh, pretty short, well as some user would privileges uh, since it's probably root or something along those lines which sounds dangerous and, and can be but you know what they do and that's something I'll go over in a future tutorial is setting it as a loop back only meaning the only person that will be able to access the web server is the computer itself uh, so you definitely would still have a concern of users on the system gaining access to something in that particular case although it hopefully will be password protected but no other computer should be able to connect to the server in that case and that's something I'll go over in a future tutorial and that's a very common used uh, technique is to start up a web server for a lot of programs and apps nowadays. You just don't really realize that you think that they're local apps, which they are, but they're actually running through a web server either like this or something designed by the developers themselves. So that's a quick look. We're going to be looking at more of HTTPD uh, BusyBox's uh, web server here in the coming weeks. And I hope that you're enjoying these tutorials. And again, this very, very lightweight, small, but still a very powerful web server. And it and BusyBox itself is under a couple of megabytes. It isn't very big at all. And this is just a small part of it. And again, already on probably your phone or router in many cases uh, and other devices like that. And I love lightweight things. I love playing around. And I love the power of this tool. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up so that I know that you enjoyed this topic. Uh, be sure to visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description. 
As always, I hope that you have a great day. If you enjoy my tutorials and would like to see more, please think about contributing to my Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. Okay, we're continuing with our series on setting up simple web servers, and we've been looking at using BusyBox and its built-in HTTPD. And we're going to continue looking at that, and we're actually going to work on uh, permissions kind of on this uh, little tutorial here with config files. We're going to uh, create a config file that has the information for our server, including uh, allow and denies and username and passwords. So uh, let's go ahead and the server here, this Raspberry Pi that I'm logged into, I have set up a folder called www in my home directory of Pi. Uh, and we've been starting it up by saying busybox httpd, saying use busybox and it's built in tool httpd. And we're going to say dash p and we're going to give it a port, whatever port you want, as long as that user has permission for that port, I'm going to go 8080. We're going to say f and v for. Uh, force it to go into the foreground and uh, give it lots of information using verbose mode. And then uh, we want to tell it dash H for whatever is going to be the root directory uh, of our web server, which in this case is home pi www. We'll hit enter there. Our server is started. Let's bring up our web browser here. The IP address for my server has changed since last time I've started recording these tutorials because I didn't set up a static IP for it, but uh, I'm just going to navigate to its IP address, tell it colon 8080 because it's we're running on port 8080, and we don't have an index file if you've been following these tutorials, but we did create a file called my.html. Uh, I'll hit enter, and there it is. It says hello world. You can see in our shell here that we have a uh, response of 200, which means it's delivered up the file all right. Okay, so that's our basic example there. So let's uh, come down here and control C to kill that. And what we're going to do now is we're going to start creating a config file. I'll say vim, I'll call it my.config or conf. This is, uh, can be called whatever you want because we're going to tell it in our command to look at that. So we'll create that. And we're going to create uh, a line here. The first line will say h colon, and that's going to be whatever the root directory of our server is, which as we just stated was home, pi, www. So this will say, you know, no matter where we're starting, if we're looking at this config file, this will be the home directory that we're working in. And as you create a config file, you can comment out lines using a pound symbol, the number symbol, if you would like to comment something out instead of having to delete the line. So we'll save that. And we'll run our last command, but instead of telling our home directory, what we're going to do is we're going to say C, and we're going to say the name of our config file. We'll hit enter here, and we will bring up our web browser again. And if I hit F5 now, you see it served it up no problem. It is working the same. So this way you can use a config file without having to give the home directory a big whoopee. It's not a big deal. Uh, things you want to think about, though, at this point, if we kill our server here, is you may want to give the full path of your config file. That way, no matter where you are when you're starting it, it will find it okay. Because it found out, I put the name of the file because it's in the folder I'm in. But doing it like so, you can be in any folder on the system and it will use that config file again. If I F5 up here, it refreshed real quick. Hello world, you can see that it was served up and uh, which computer was requesting that so you also know who's accessing your server. Let's add to our config file here. We will vim my config and we'll add a line. We'll add two lines actually A and D. Uh, a will be allow and D will be deny. So with D, we can say, okay, I don't want actually before we have this allow, we're going to say 192.168.1.1. 150. That was the that's my computer that I'm working on now that I'm connecting to that server with. So we're saying deny that IP address. 
So that computer from that IP address will not be allowed to connect to this server. Alternatively, you can also say a asterisk symbol that says deny access to everybody. Don't let anybody connect to this server. Well, what good is that? Well, that's why we have this allow. So now you can give a list of IP addresses that you do want to allow. So if you only want certain computers to be able to access this web server, you can use this allow. Now remember, you know, in a lot of cases people can fake IP addresses, but here's a case um, that we're going to use. We're going to say 192 or sorry, 127.0.0.1 and that's itself. That's local host. Uh, if you're not familiar with servers and, and, and how they uh, dish out IP addresses, one point, uh, sorry, 127.0.0.1 is set aside for yourself. That's how you loop back to yourself. Lots of times you might type into a browser localhost to get that. And that's only if your computer's set up to redirect localhost to that. And that's your loop back device. Um, in fact, if I save that, if I type in ifconfig to look at my, my uh, network settings, you see that you have this loop back device right here, LO. And that's your local loop back. And you can see right here, it's 127.0.0.1. And that's like a, basically a virtual network device. Uh, so you're looping back to yourself without having to use your Wi-Fi or your Ethernet. So even if you don't have those connected, you can still loop back to yourself. So going back to our config file, we're saying don't let anybody in unless it's this IP address. So what this is saying is only allow the server to connect to itself. And this, again, as I mentioned briefly in a previous tutorial, commonly used with a lot of application nowadays. Um, and it just allows you to run these web-based applications locally without having to access any network or external server you're connecting to yourself. So if I was to save this as like that, and I was to run my command again using that config file, and I was to come into here and I try refreshing this, it's going to say, give me an error of 403 forbidden. And you can also see that down here. So you can have a, a list of, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, computers that are trying to access that are denied. So you can see if someone's constantly trying to connect. Now, so the server's up and running, but denying everybody. So I can't connect there. Just to show you uh, that it is working. I'm going to open up another window here. So down here, this shell is also running on the same Raspberry Pi and I can use my wget command which should be on your system already and I am going to say uh, localhost and I'm going to say port 8080 and the name of the file I want to look at is my HTML and we're going to say Q for quiet and dash capital O dash so it's just going to output that file and as you can see it did retrieve it because I am connecting from the server to itself now if you have a problem doing this with localhost which in some cases you might you might have to put in the IP address of 127.0.0.1 and I'll hit enter and you can see we it served up okay now again this server that we're running on we know the IP address is 192.168.1.121. And if we hit enter now, ah, we didn't get it. Even though we're connecting from that server to itself, just as we did in these two commands, it's actually not using that loopback device. It's actually using, in this case, my Ethernet port. And it's going out and coming back in and it's going, whoa, whoa, we don't want this. So this is good using this, uh, the local host or the loopback device should help prevent, I'm pretty sure about this, <laughs> any packet sniffing. Because even if you were to say, oh, hey, allow this IP address, it's actually going out to the network and coming back in. So anybody on your network could be sniffing that information using the loopback device, the only computer that can sniff that information is the server itself. So uh, much more secure doing that way. And again, it, it helps prevent people from, you know, booting you off the network and changing the IP address or something along those lines, uh, theoretically possible. So uh, that is denying service to 
all IPs except for the loopback device. Let's take it a step further and uh, allow other people to connect but require usernames and passwords. So I'm going to control C here to kill that out, clear the screen, and again I'm going to go into my config file and I'm going to comment out these lines because I want to be able to connect from the computer on that right now to display this. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say forward slash colon and we'll create a username. I'll say Bob colon and we'll give it a password. We'll say my pass. What this is saying is root directory, user, and password. So now if I save this, run our server using that config file, and now try to refresh this, you can see it asks for a username and password. And I will say, what did I say, Bob, and I said my pass, enter. And there we go, it brought up the um, hello world, because I typed in the proper username and password, and it saves it so if I refresh, it's still doing that. So actually, let's go back into our config file here real quick and change the password to my pass too. Save that. Start up our server again. Now, if I refresh, it asks again because the username and password is wrong. So I want to do something here just to demonstrate something. I'm going to say Bob and I'm going to type in blah, blah, blah. I'm just typing a bunch of stuff. It's not the correct password. I'm going to say login. And you can see it gave a response of 401. Um, it's It's you weren't able to access it. We didn't get 200 and you can see again it asks for the username and password. Now keep in mind if you're not using security keys as I'm not here, this is being transmitted in plain text which again since I'm going across the network in this case anybody on my network sniffing traffic can very easily get this username and password in which case if I was using the loopback which again would only work on the server itself uh, that would not be the case as far as I know. Um, because it's using the virtual loopback device rather than your Ethernet port. Um, so keep that in mind that even though you're using passwords here, everything is unencrypted um, and so everybody can see it. Now, uh, speaking of which, another th issue here is that our password is in plain text inside our config file and that's not good because if someone gets hold of that file now they know your password so what we want to do is we want to use hash to hash out our password uh, and we can do this and then if someone was to get access to the config file they could still use that hash to access the server but they still don't know your password so if you were to happen to use the same password on other machines they won't be able to access those other machines uh, you know let's say you use the same password for your Google account they uh, if they did get this hash whether they got it through packet sniffing or got it getting a hold of the config file they'll be able to access this server but they won't necessarily be able to access um, your other stuff because they still don't know your password and even then we're still using hashes so and so yeah anyway let me get on to demonstrating that so we have to generate a hash first so let's go ahead kill our server here and the HTTP and BusyBox has a built-in function for doing this so we're going to say BusyBox HTTPD dash M and then we're going to in quotations give our password so here we'll say again we'll say my pass and we'll say my pass three to give it a new password we'll hit enter and right there we have our hash so now we get to go into our config file vim my config and over here instead of the password you put the hash and then we save it run our server again using that config file and hopefully if we hit F5 we'll ask for the password again we'll say Bob and we'll say my pass 3 enter and we logged in so much better to do that way and it takes one extra step it's built into HTTPD you just have to generate it and replace it in the config file so that your passwords aren't sitting there in plain text so uh, also, last thing I want to go over in today's tutorial, killing our server here, clearing the screen, going up here, let's clear the screen again, 
Uh, going into our config file again, we're saying slash here, that's the root directory. You don't have to password everything. If you want to password a certain directory, you can do so. So in this case, I can say slash, um, we'll call a folder private. So I'll do that and I'll make a directory called private. And inside that directory, I'll say private index.html and I'll just say this is my private stuff. Now if we run our server again using that config file, I come up here and I hit F5, you notice it served it up, response 200, gave me my hello world up here without asking for a username and password. If I was to try to go into my private directory though and hit enter, private index.html. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> I know the problem. I created the uh, folder inside the wrong folder. Let's go ahead and uh, make this uh, full screen here. Clear this out. I created it in my home directory. Let's move my private directory onto our server uh, directory, which is www. So I just created that in the wrong directory. And uh, we can now run our server, BusyBox HTTP, you know, using that config file. So again, the, the problem was the private folder wasn't on our web server I created in the wrong directory. But now that it's there, I can again hit F5 here, and there is my private stuff. Um, of course, it didn't ask for the username and password because I've already entered it. So let's go ahead and do a better example <laughs> where it actually asked for the username and password. We're going to say um, my config, and I'm just going to do a plain text password here just to move this along. I'm going to say my pass4. Save that, run our server, and again, if I go here to uh, my.html, I can view that. But if I try to go into the private folder, it asks for username and password, and I'll say Bob my pass four, and there I can see this is my private stuff. So things to remember: make sure you actually put the files you're trying to access inside your web server directory. Um, <laughs> that's obviously very important. Um, so that's it. I hope that you learned something today. Again, BusyBox is on many, many systems out there. I kind of said a couple weeks ago that it's on pretty much every system, and that's not true. That Well, it's still on most systems, especially, again, lightweight systems, routers, phones, uh, other small devices. And if you have one that has HTTPD installed on it, uh, compiled into it, you're all set for having a pretty full web server that can do a lot of things. Again, remember that it's running as the user that's starting it up unless you tell it otherwise. Uh, so it has the permissions of that user. So if you start it as root, your web server is now running as root and any of the script files it runs run as root. Remember that unless you're using security keys, uh, everything's unencrypted. So even though you're using usernames and passwords. If you're using something other than your loopback device, anybody can sniff that traffic and get a hold of that information as well as everything that's being transmitted. So I thank you as always for watching. I ask that you visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, this is an introduction to filmsbychris.com. I'm Chris, that's Chris the K. That's me right there. My daughter Ember, and my wife Jennifer. We pretty much live in the swamps of Florida. I'm a firefighter by day, as well as by night. We work long hours. But that's not why you're here. You're here about the videos I put up on YouTube. These videos are mainly about computers and programming, which means most of my videos look something like this. And if that's what you're interested in, great! 
If not, that's alright. I do videos on other topics too, such as video editing, special effects, photo editing, 3D design, and music creation. If you are one of my viewers and you enjoy my videos, my Patreon page is a place where you can go to help support my videos. So I ask that you take the time to go to my Patreon page and look at different levels of rewards you can receive for different levels of backing. There should be a link in the description of this video if you are watching it on YouTube. Otherwise, you can visit patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. And I thank you for your time and your support. Have a great day. great if you had just a bunch of old cell phones lying around that you could make phone calls with them. Even better yet, not using a service out there, just using the internet. Being able to talk to friends or family directly without even setting up a server. Well, that's what we're going to look at today. Look at this. It's my EPC from like 12 years ago. It cost me like five, six hundred bucks. One gig of RAM, four gig solid state drive left in it. There used to be a second one for storage, but Right now I'm running off an SD card. Uh, I just need a second computer uh, that I can put up here for you to show you guys. This thing runs very slow and it gets so hot, which is part of the issues with it. But today we're going to be looking at Linphone. So Linphone is a SIP application, SIP. So uh, it's going to allow you to make phone calls uh, through the internet or through your network. Now, normally you would set up a server or use a service somewhere as a server. But I'm going to show you today that it's very simple if you're on the same network to just directly connect to another computer without a server. There's no encryption for this, so you'd want to be on a private network and stuff like that. Uh, but this is very useful. Like sometimes my daughter's in her room and we're playing a video game or something, and I want to be able to voice chat with her. And there's lots of ways you can do that, but this is super simple. There's a GUI interface we're going to look at today, but if you guys like this topic, I can show you a little bit more about it in the future. I don't know a whole lot, but I know the basics of setting up a server, also connecting to clients outside of your system, and there's also a complete shell-based version of Linphone to where you can make calls, receive calls, answer calls, all that good stuff right in your terminal. So, Let's go ahead and have a look. Uh, I'm going to be running a Debian-based system here, and let's go ahead and install Linfoam. So again, I'm using a Debian-based Alive system here, running off a flash drive. It's Anti-X, which is just a lightweight Debian-based distro. And uh, I'm just going to use, <laughs> wrong keyboard, sudo apt install Linfoam. Enter and then type in the password. Now again, I'm using apt here, uh, which is a standard uh, package manager for Debian-based systems. Uh, Linphone is going to be on pretty much all your major Linux distributions. So use whatever package manager, whether it's a shell or a GUI package manager, and just install Linphone. Once it's installed, you can run it from the shell just by typing Linphone and hitting enter. Or, of course, you can go to your menus and select it from your applications. So I'm going to go to my menus here, and on this particular one, it's under Applications. It's under uh, Network, I believe, or Internet for this distribution, and Linphone. And it will open up. Now, the GUI opens up, but it also puts an icon down in your system tray. So if I was to close this uh, GUI, it's still going to be running as a service down here. And, of course, you can bring that up just by clicking on it and it brings the GUI back up. So now applications like this can get real advanced. Again, if you have a server and it's actually hooked to a phone line, you can actually make real phone calls to real uh, cell phones or landlines uh, through this protocol. But we're just doing network to network. So how does that work? So basically, when we're in here in the application, your phone number is going to be your username at your IP address. So on my desktop computer, my name is MetalX1000, and my IP address on the local network is 192.168.1.155. So right here in this little bar, I type in SIP colon MetalX1000 at 192.168.1.155. And 
it will show up here and I can choose to either make a video call, make a regular call, or even send text messages. So right now, I'm gonna click this call button and I have Lynn phone running in the background on my desktop machine. And when I click that button, I get a phone call. So this rings and this rings and then all I have to do is on my desktop, click the pickup button. And as long as you have your microphone and speaker set up properly, you are now in a voice conversation. Now again, there was a video option and there's also a texting option. Uh, and again, we're connecting directly. If you go through a server, you have an option to set up encryption and you'll have logins and passwords for users, but I'm just connecting directly. So there's no encryption and you can see that if you look at the application, there's a red lock icon that is unlocked letting you know that basically anybody on your network can be hearing what you're saying. Obviously it's not just magic, they're not just everybody's gonna all of a sudden hear what you're saying, but if they're sniffing your network. And uh, SIP, this is the same if you're in an office environment and you have a network of phones, uh, this is running on the same protocol. In fact, uh, over a decade ago, uh, where I work, they got network phones and they put them on the same network as all the other computers and I was able to sniff traffic and uh, using Wireshark I was able to hear both sides of the conversation would record them as separate wave files uh, so that's something to think about but again I'm on a closed encrypted network with my family and this is just I'm using it to connect to my daughter's room sometimes to talk to her or my son if we're playing video games but you can set up a network uh, a server with encryption and you can also set up uh, you know, an account elsewhere, such as uh, Lynn Phone has a website where you can set up free uh, a free account. Now, you can also get a Lynn Phone app, of course, free and open source for your phone. It's available in F Droid, and you can do the same exact thing. As long as you're on the same network, you put in the IP address, their username, you know, SIP colon, the username, at, and the IP address. And of course, it puts it into your uh, recent call history, so you don't have to type that every time. You can just go to your history. Also on your phone, you can grant it access to your contacts. And once it does that, if you have uh, a SIP information for them in their contacts, you can use that to contact people. Uh, and of course, uh, video, I can show you the video, uh, the EPC here. It's so slow, it's very jerky, so it isn't a very good demonstration of that. But if you're interested in this, I can definitely do more on this topic later. Uh, again, setting up your own server, which I just know enough to get a server up and running, uh, or accessing the LinPhone, uh, creating an account on LinPhone and getting that set up on your phone, because that took me a, a little bit to figure that out, how to do that. It's not that hard, although I recommend setting up your account on your computer, because on the app on the phone, it really wants you to enter a phone number to create an account. But if you do it on your desktop or laptop, you don't have to, and then you can access it on your phone. And uh, also, again, video chat, texting, and once you set up a server, then you can you know, link to this from outside your network, but if you're gonna do that, you may also wanna look into using a server such as LinPhone. So real quick as an example here, so when you're running LinPhone on an Android device, it's gonna be running in the background as a service. There's a little icon up in your um, system tray here, if that's what it's called on the phone, I forget. Uh, but I'm gonna call myself from my desktop to my phone. So I click that, it comes up, and it uses the ringtone that I use for my regular phone calls. I can answer, and then I can just talk. And again, we can do video and texting that way as well. So uh, a few more examples. Again, here's my laptop, here's my phone. I'm going to call my phone from my desktop, which is up here out of view. So I'm gonna call that, my phone's gonna ring, I'm gonna answer it. So now I'm in a conversation that way. Now on the laptop, I'm going to call my desktop. And my desktop's ringing, and I get this on the screen. When I pick it up, what's fun here, if I switch my phone over speaker mode, I'm on hold, and it plays hold music for you, which is pretty cool. And of course, you can do conference calling too. So I'm gonna click this button up here that says start conference call. There's also a, a start, uh, a open a conference, uh, which has a little text bubble. But I'm gonna do the one with the phone. Just like before, I put in the username, at, and their IP address, and then I add them. I already did that for my cell phone. Now I'll do that for the laptop that we're demoing, demoing things on. And all I have to do is click start and both my laptop and my phone are ringing. I can answer here and I can answer here. And now we are on a conference call. You can also transfer calls and do everything that you would do, uh, you know, with stand, oh, the phone call's still going on. Okay, I hung up on all three devices. Um, but yeah, this is just like, you know, a phone you would have in an office. And if you had a phone on your system, uh, you know, on your network that is a SIP phone, a, a voice uh, over IP phone, 
uh, there's a good chance, one, that it's running Linux, uh, and it's using a SIP protocol. So this is something very interesting to use. It's something that I've played around with in the past, but haven't really gotten into, and I've just been playing around with it lately. So if you're interested in more of this stuff, I just showed a basic overview of some of the stuff you can do with the basic GUI. Um, I hope that all made sense to you. Uh, but if you are interested, I can, again, do the same thing uh, using just Shell, which is nice, because uh, it, it's also helpful, like, if my daughter is on her computer, I can log in and start up uh, Lynn phone and answer it and start talking to her, uh, even if she doesn't answer, even though she's just a room over. Um, and then also I can show the very basics of just getting a server up and running. Um, that's as far as I got, is setting up a few accounts and logging in. And then also setting up an account on uh, Lynn phone that's uh, free to set up an account and then you can, uh, like my, my kids uh, both have cell phones that they use when we're on vacations, mainly as, as uh, cameras, but if they're on Wi-Fi, they can call me or text me, uh, which is pretty cool, even though they don't have a cellular service that is using some of my old phones. So let me know, comment below, let me know it, what parts of that sound interesting to you, if this is something you're interested in, and if a lot of people are interested, in, I will do some more videos on this. So. Thanks for watching. Uh, visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris of the K. Also check out my Patreon page, uh, patreon.com forward slash metalx1000 if you're looking to support me. And as always, I just hope that you have a great day. Okay, here we are again with you looking down on me from up above. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at something similar to what I did a couple of weeks ago in a video. We talked about Netcat or NC or NCAT. Slightly different things. All kind of do the same thing. But I mentioned a few times in that video, and I've had a few comments asking about doing something like that encrypted which is what we're going to look at today. But what we're going to use is called SoCat, which is basically kind of like Netcat, but it has encryption options. I'm going to show you some very basic aspects of it. I do want to start off by saying is that a lot of what you may want to do, at least for personal stuff, if you want to do something secure across a network, just use SSH. SSH in, you can, you can transmit stuff you can do any anything you want through ssh i understand there's going to be cases where you can't do that you don't want to create accounts for everybody you know if you're creating an app you you just want it to be able to connect with encryption keys so we're, we're going to look at some simple stuff today basically doing some similar stuff to we did last time we're going to get a like a, a shell going remotely uh but let's go ahead and jump right in so yeah you're gonna have to have uh uh, SoCat installed, and we're also going to be using OpenSSL to uh, generate some keys. So use your package manager, it should be in your repositories. And also, the um, notes for all this are up on Pastebin. Check out the links in the description. I'm going to go over things uh, fairly briefly here. You know, uh, I'm going to do a lot of copy and pasting because it's a lot of typing. Um, but again, the notes are in the description of this video. Now, looking at the screen here. Uh, I have two different machines here. Uh, the top up here that says Fort is going to be our server. And that's actually uh, my old ThinkPad that I do use as a server to back up files to, which is on the other side of the room over there. And then Chip, the bottom part of the screen here, is my local, my new ThinkPad that I use as my main computer. Fort and Chip are actually both references to Punisher Comics. You may get those references you probably won't anyway here we go so first thing we need to do is generate keys for both our server and clients so up in our server here we're going to use open ssh we're going to use open ssh gen rsa that's the type of key we're going to be generating the output i'm going to just create a file in the current directory called server.key and it's going to be 200 or 2048 bits okay um you're going to want to store this somewhere on your system if you're going to use it more than once. I'm just doing it in this temporary directory because I'm just doing it for this video. Uh, but create that, generate it, save it someplace that you're going to be able to access it. Okay, now we're going to take that and we're going to generate a certificate with it. Again, here, we're going to require a new key. So you can look at all this stuff in the man file. But basically, we're saying create a key. It's not going to expire for uh, 365, three days. So it's going to, it's going to last for a long, long time. Uh, and so we're going to take the key that we generated here, and we're going to create the certificate. Boom. Now, it's going to ask you a number of things. 
you can leave all these blank except for one. When I first tried doing this, it, it, it messed me up because I, I skipped through all of them. But what we want to do is we want to click through them. You can, again, fill in this information if you want. Until you get to common name, you need to fill this out. And it needs to either be the IP address of the machine you're generating the key on or the domain name, whichever you're going to use to connect to it. So uh, I'm just going to use the IP address, which on my local network, this one is 192.168.1.1. 150. Boom. I'll leave the email address blank. So now I can list it out. I have a key. I have a certificate. Let's go ahead. And from there, what we're going to do is we're going to cap both those files into a new file. So we have server key, server certificate, and we're going to put it in a uh, uh, PME file. And these are all just plain text files. So I can actually at this point cat out server.pme and it'll actually show us the key. I'll make it full screen here. So we have our key, whoop, our key, our private key, and our certificate, okay? Now, I need to put that on the client machine as well. So all I have to do in this case, again, I'll make that full screen. I'll make my terminal. Now, if I, I'm connected through SSH, so I could transfer this file over, but since it's not very long and it's just plain text, I'm gonna copy it. I'm going to come down here. I'm going to say cat into server.pme or pem, uh, and then I will paste that information in there and control D, or you can use vim or whatever text editor, but I've shown you in the past that you can just use cat as a text editor. So now let me zoom back in here. I have that file on my client down here at the bottom and I can cat it out. And as long as I copied everything properly, it's good to go. But now we also want to make sure that the permissions are set properly on this. So we're going to use change mod 600 on both our key and our PEM file, PEM, P-E-M file. And this is just saying, basically, you don't want other people on the system to be able to read or edit this file. Uh, they don't, you don't want them to have access to it at all. And uh, so we're going to use 600, which I believe will give you, you know, uh, read permission to it, but it will uh, actually, let's just list out here real quick. Uh, yeah, you have read right to it, but it's not executable and no one else can read it. Okay. So we've generated our keys for the server. We're going to do the same exact thing for the client. So here we go. We're going to generate the key. Now we're going to generate the certificate. This time I'm going to call it uh, client key and client certificate. Again, click through these. And then when I get here, I'll put in my IP address, which is that. Okay, and then we will cat those into this file. We will then change the permissions for it. And now I'm going to cat out that client PEM file. There we go. And since that's my local machine, again, I could zoom out and copy it, or I can use something like XClip. So now it's in my clipboard. And up here I can say cat into client.pem. I can now paste that file and then I will hit control D and you can even see, you know, just checking the last line of it, I copy the right thing. Okay. So I got that copied over. We both have certificates. Now we're, we're ready to roll. We have certificates created and shared and sharing. It's always the hardest part. I don't know if I said this earlier in the video. It's like, how do you encrypt something and pass a key to somebody uh, without somebody else getting it? If you want everything to private, I mean, there's public and private keys, but you need to share things at certain ways. It's, it's, uh, it can be confusing. It can be difficult. So I'm just sharing things through SSH here. So when I'm transferring that stuff, it's all encrypted anyway. Uh, but yeah, you have to transfer those somehow protected. Okay, now we're going to start using SOCAT. So, so far, all we've done is generated keys, which can be used for lots of different things, encrypting files, encrypting anything, right? So we're going to use SOCAT and we're going to say open SSL because that's the type of key we're using. Uh, and, oh, you know what? I'm copying the client's information into the server. We don't want that. We're going to say socat open SSL dash listen. We're going to give it a port. Here, I'm just going to use 4443. Uh, we're going to use reuse address at IPv4 and fork. So reuse address just is basically, if you read the man file, it's telling you that the server is able to restart right away and fork will allow you to... So basically, when I connect, it allows other clients to connect while I'm connected and when I disconnect, the server keeps running, okay? Now we're gonna say the certificate for the, the server, the machine I'm on, and the client, okay? 
And then here I'm just saying dash. That means anything that comes in, just show it to standard output so it will display on the screen. So we're just going to be sending messages back and forth. So I'll start that up. And now down here, and again, all this is in the notes in the description on Pastebin. I am going to again, SOCAT. Open SSL. Now I just need to put in the IP address or domain name if I have a domain name for the server and oh, 50 uh, and the port number. Verify zero. Not really sure what that means. I should look that up, <laughs> but that's just uh, examples that I learned from. That's what they did. Now, again, the certificate is going to be the one for the current machine, and then the CA file is going to be the one for the uh, server machine, the remote machine. And then again, we're going to do just the dash saying standard output. So now I hit that. Now I can start typing stuff. I can say hello and they can then up here, oops, <laughs> up here I can say, hey buddy. So we are messaging back and forth using encryption. So these are all the commands. Once you have the, the keys generated, these are the commands to start up a server and these are the commands to connect to that server. If I come down here, I can split this screen let me go ahead and copy and paste this exact same command down here just to show you I'm going to connect to the server again. Now I have two clients connected to the same server. Uh, and I can say, hey, pal, and that goes to the server. Uh, okay, control C to kill out of that and close this window now and kill that with control C, but the server's still running, but I'll come up here and hit control C. So again, that's what the uh, fork does. It allows it to keep running and allow multiple connections to the server. Uh, okay, so what else can we do with this? There's lots of different options, but uh, you can have it execute a command when someone, when a client connects and the output can go to that client. So for example, I can say exec, so we're gonna execute, we're gonna execute, we're gonna say bin date. So we're saying when a client connects, run the date command. So if down here I run the same exact command I ran last time, I connect, it gives me the date and time of the server and then disconnects and the server is still running so I can run it again and get that date and time again. So if you needed to synchronize your clocks, there's better ways to synchronize your clocks between machines and most things are synchronized uh, with the internet now. But, uh, but yeah, you can run any command. So for example, instead of the date command, I can just say bash. Now, you have yourself an encrypted remote shell. Uh, so I can come up here, same, cam same command for the client, and now I can list and I can see the files in here. I can type date, it will show me the date. Uh, I can do, I don't know what other commands can I do. Uh, if config, there we go, we got the if config of the server. And you don't get the prompt and everything nice like you do if you SSH in, but it's running those commands and outputting it to your screen here. Let's give one more example here. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back up to this first one where we're just, <clears throat> excuse me, passing information back and forth. I can pipe stuff into my server. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me again. Uh, I can pipe stuff into the client to go to the server is what I meant. So we're going to do this. So last time I showed you that uh, I could, I, I think I wrote a, a uh, little program in Godot where it tracked my mouse cursor and sent that information. Well, uh, XEV, if you're on a Linux machine running Xorg, that will show you when you start that up, you get this window and uh, it will show you whatever keys you're pressing. But also when you move the mouse, it shows you the coordinates. It shows you both the local within that window and also the um, the total, the, the global. So I actually have three monitors here. So when I'm right here, it's showing that uh, my uh, position is pretty far over. Uh, but go ahead, let's go ahead and clear that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this command here, and I'm just going to pipe in XEV. And I'm going to pipe that over to the server there. Something went wrong. What did I do wrong here? Um, <laughs> is the server running? <laughs> I didn't start the server. There we go. Now we'll run it. And now you can see when I'm doing it here, it's sending it to the server up here. So this is the server. And as I'm moving, all that information is being displayed on the server, being sent to the server real time. I mean, instantly, boom, 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 right? Uh, control Q to get out of that or whatever keys you use to close a window. Uh, what I can also do is uh, I can also, since I'm piping this into stuff, I can pipe it into something like grep and I can grep for root colon 
and I can do that. And now when I send it, it's going to trim out some of that information. So it's just giving the line. And if I come down here, it might be a little bit clearer. It's just giving the line with the time. And also you can see the coordinates of the mouse cursor. Now, something I did try to do uh, that didn't work out so great. If I came up here, if I try to pipe this into cut and I say cut, make this a little smaller, uh, with the colon dash F2, I was thinking that I'd be able to cut just this information here. And it works, but the cut command is obviously a little slow and there's probably a better option for this because when I do this, it does work, but you can see it's lagging. It's like showing it in chunks and it's not instantaneous. So there's gotta be a better way to do that, but I'm just showing you that you can pipe things, you know, from the client into the server and then the output from the server into another process if you need to. So yeah, so that's SoCat in a nutshell. Again, uh, check out the links in the description to everything I just did. Um, and again, for personal stuff, if you're looking for security, SSH is, uh, is awesome. Uh, for most things, you know, but SoCat is great if you need to do these quick little application things across the network and you want to encrypt it. It's just like Netcat or NCAT or NC, uh, but with encryption options. You can also use it without the encryption options and it works kind of like Netcat. Um, but uh, one of the main reasons you would use it is for encryption. And here we used Open uh, SSL. Again, uh, it supports other types of encryption as well, but that's a very commonly used one. I do thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris of the K. There is a link in the description. And as always, uh, I hope that you have a great day. Well, last week we were looking at uh, setting up a very basic web server using Python. And uh, one thing you couldn't do with that basic setup was have server-side scripts running. So today we're going to be looking at the options that are built into Python. So if you have Python on your system, you should be able to do this. Uh, that allow you to not only run a web server, but to run a web server uh, with server-side scripts. Uh, so first thing you need to do is you're going to have to create a CGI bin folder. Uh, unless you're going to change the configuration by default, all your server side scripts should go inside a folder called CGI bin. If they're not in there, then they're not going to execute as a, as a server side script. Um, so, uh, you would do make der CGI dash bin. I have already created one of those and I've put a couple of scripts in there. Now to start our server up, what we want to do is we want to start up Python, say dash M to load up the module and we'll say CGI HTTP and this is case sensitive, capital S server. And also you want to tell it what port. Again, certain ports will be blocked by certain, uh, by lower uh, permission users. Uh, so use a port that your user is allowed to use. I'll just say 8,000 here. I'll hit enter and you can see server HTTP on uh, 0000 port 80. So it's running on this computer port, I'm sorry, port 8,000. Now if we look at our web browser, we can go to our web server. Again, this is on the local machine. So I can type in localhost. I can type in 127.0.0.1. I can type in um, my uh, local domain uh, using the hostname.local or I can put in my IP address. Of course, this is running locally. If you're going to be on outside of the local network, you'll have to set up port forwarding. Uh, but I know that my IP address is uh, 192.168.1.150 for this current computer. And as I said, uh, port 80 is what we're using. So colon, uh, sorry, port 8000. So we're using colon 8000. So anyone on the local network should be able to type that into their server and they will get greeted with a directory list. Luckily, just like the simple HTTPD uh, server that Python uses, there is going to be a automatically generated uh, list directory list if there's no index file. And of course, there's a CGI bin. Now, if I try to click on the CGI bin, it's going to give me an error. Uh, it's not going to give you a directory output, a directory list of what's in the CGI bin. This is one of the main uh, security things that are put into place because you don't necessarily want people um, viewing all your scripts because certain scripts may uh, 
you, you basically just want to be careful with server-side scripts because they're actually running on your machine. They can manipulate things not only uh, as far as the web server goes, but could also manipulate things on your system. So you want to be very careful using uh, server-side scripts. So it's going to require you to directly go to a script you created. Let me open up a new shell here and go into my CGI bin. And by the way, when you run the server, it's using the current directory as the root directory for your web server, unless you tell it otherwise. And again, the CGI bin is where your scripts are going to be. I've got a few in here, a few bash scripts, a couple of Python scripts. It does not matter what type of script or program it is, uh, as long as your computer can run it and you've given it permission to run. So let's go ahead and have a look at this hello.sh. We say that it's a bash script, and we're going to do the output again. You're going to have to tell it uh, that the first line has to be content type, and in this case, text slash HTML, and then you need to have an empty line after that before you start your code. And here we're just going to echo out something simple, but you could run any program that you want. Uh, so here's a very basic example. Again, if you're running this and for some reason you get this text output and not the actual script output, it's because you this you might have put an extra line in there. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. But we have this. This file is called hello.sh. You have to make it executable with change mod. I've already done that, but I'll show you change mod plus x and the name of your script. Running these on your web server is same as running it on your current computer. So if I was to run inside my shell here, hello.sh, you can see the output here. First line is this, then we have a blank line, and then our HTML code, which can be one line, but it can be a whole web page as well. So let's go ahead and run that up here. So to run that up here, all we have to do now that it's in there and made executable is, again, the address of the server, the port. If it's not port 80, if it's port 80, your browser will default to that. CGI bin and the name of the script. We'll go ahead and hit enter, and you can see we've got hello world. We can look at the code for that, which is just the text output there. I can go into that script again, and I can add another line. I can say echo this is a test, and I can give it more HTML tags if I want. I'm not going to here. I can save that, and if I was to close this and refresh this page, you can see now that text is right there. But again, we can also uh, say give it a line break. Actually, we'll give it a horizontal line break there. And next, I can just run a command. If I wanted to list out the files in the current directory, I can use the list command. Uh, now, do keep in mind that if you want line breaks and things such as that, you're going to have to implement the HTML code for that. So it will output the files in this folder, um, but not necessarily on a new line for each one. But let's go ahead and refresh that, and you can see the files in this folder. Um, or actually, it's giving the files in the main folder. I did not expect that. <laughs> um, but just keep in mind that things aren't going to be on the new lines. You have to implement that. You'll put this through a while loop if you want. Should be able to do something like um, while read line do echo dollar sign line and we'll do a line break like that. And that should, now, if I hit F5, put each thing on a new line. If we look at the code, you can see that they're all on new lines with line breaks. Again, if we didn't have that, and we just had the list, if I refresh the code up here, you can see everything's on a new line, but because we're writing our interface in HTML, you need to have those HTML codes for the new line. Very, very basic. HTML. If you've worked with HTML before, you understand this is very simple. I just wanted to point that out in case someone has never worked with HTML. Okay, so that's a basic little script. We have a lot of echo lines there. Let's go ahead and look at another script that I called uh, hello2.sh. And again, the extension .sh means absolutely nothing to the computer. Just as it means nothing when you're working in the shell, it means nothing on the web server. The extension means nothing. The most important thing is, of course, to have your shebang line, which is this first line here, saying this is a bash script. If you don't have that, the, 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 it's going to try to use the default shell, which is going to be a problem in some cases with bash scripts. Uh, if bash is not your, 
your default. But if you're using other programming languages like Python, which we'll get into in a minute, that's definitely going to cause problems. Here's another example. I use this dash E here, so now I can put these new lines here. So it's, this is the same original code that we had before. It's putting out this line of code, and then it's going line break, line break, so it has an empty line, and then it does our HTML code there. So let me go ahead, come up here. I'll hit two. So hello two.sh, and you can see that is the output of this file. So if you want to put it all on one line, you can if it's something simple like that. Let's look at another example hello3.sh and here you can see that I am using cat and EOF although this doesn't have to be EOF, EOF stands for end of file if you want to have more than one you can label them different things basically what this is saying is everything between this EOF until there is a new line that has nothing but EOF on it print that out to the screen so I'm doing the same thing here uh, you know the context type content type blank line Hello world, and then I'm also putting in a uh, image here. So definitely, if you're going to output a full HTML page, you don't want to echo out each line. You can cut it out like this. So here's an example. We can go three, hit enter, and there we go. We have hello world, and the image, which is the code down here. Now things to be careful about. If I do this and try running this page again, you can see it outputs the text and not. Uh, doesn't output it as an HTML file because it doesn't realize it's an HTML file because the first line has to be this followed by a blank line for an HTML file otherwise it thinks it's just a text file to display and so if you put an extra space in there like that or an extra blank line in there like that or anything before that it's it's gonna not work right so if you're gonna be using the cat uh, and a file it might be a good idea to pretty much always start your files off like this and that way if we refresh you can see it works no matter what you change inside this main portion of the document it's not going to screw that up so that's another pointer for you so we've worked with some bash scripts here if I list out here in our CGA C CGI file you can see that I have a couple of Python scripts again the extension is for your knowledge not the computer it does not care what the extension is it cares about the shebang line uh, and if I do vim hello dot py you can see I have a very basic I have my shebang line which can be written in different ways but as long as you have it and it works on your system this is saying what type of environment to use basically the interpreter we're going to be using Python and again if you're using a different version of Python all depends on how your server is set up and again same thing I'm printing out the content type a blank line and then my code so HTML uh, code saying hello world as a, a header so if I come in here and I change this to dot py hello dot py that's just again because that's the name of the file we'll hit enter and you can see it says hello world now I have a, another Python file in here called python2 or hello2.py just to show you similar to the cat and a file we're using three quotation marks here and three quotation marks here everything between that is going to be uh, output it as text so you don't have to do a different print line for each line of your HTML file if you're going to be generating HTML file with your server-side scripts so again I put my print line uh, for the content type and the blank line these can be done on one line but you want to kind of I would advise doing that separate from the main portion of your web page just to prevent again if you accidentally put an extra line in there or an extra character or something it won't run properly so that's HTML or that's hello 2.py hit enter and there you go it's displaying an image it says hello world now again as I said it does not matter whether it's a, a bash file a, a Python script Perl script and any type of script or any program that can run on your computer can be used as a server-side script and that's why you can use HTML as a GUI for any program and I'm going to show you an example of that um, if I go back into my main fo uh, folder here, oh, I also want to show you, if we go back into our main folder here, I have a Python script here that's executable. If I click that, you can dis see it displays it as text. It's not inside the CGI file, so it's going to run like that. Um, so your server-side scripts have to be inside that CGI bin file. Now, I also have, as you can see here, a hello world file, uh, or a C code, which is a very basic, has a main function, prints out the uh, content type and a new line you can see I have two 
uh, backslash ends there, that's a new line and a blank line, and I can print f hello world. So what I can do, I can come down here, I can say gcc, that's the compiler I use, I can say hello.c, and I can say my output is cgi bin hello, and again the extension doesn't matter, but I'm just going to say dot bin, just so I know that that's a, a binary file. So I just compiled that, and if I was to actually cat that out, dot bin, uh, so I cut out that file. You can see it is a binary file. It is a C file. It is it is compiled. So it doesn't matter whether it's a script or if it's a, a, a compiled program. If it's inside the CGI folder and it has executable rights, uh, it can run. Uh, so if I come up here and I go back into my CGI bin folder and I say forward slash hello.bin, again the, ex the extension, the bin part means nothing, it's just letting me know that's an executable file. I can say .exe, it doesn't matter, it's on a Linux system, it's still compiled for Linux. And I'll hit enter and you can see it says hello from C, because that's what the, the code was. And again, uh, also the, the content type, .html, uh, and that blank line, that, that's for the output. Uh, you don't even need that if you're just running the script. Let's say you're gonna have some code that you can wanna access through your web server and it does something on the server and you're not gonna have any output. It, that doesn't even really matter uh, very much, although you pretty much always have some sort of output, even if it's just script run complete or whatever. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description. Uh, again, this is using Python as a web server. Let's go ahead and look at that main script. Also, you can see there was output here. Every time we accessed a file, just like when we ran servers before, what files are being accessed. 200 means it was served up properly. Uh, and like if it's 404, you know it's not there. 403 is um, permissions issue, I think. That's that's what we were getting there. And again, the command is python-m and capital CGI HTTPS server. So CGI HTTP server, case sensitive, and then what port you want to run it on. And when you run that, whatever folder you're in, it will be running as uh, as that as the root directory for your web server and all your scripts will go inside a CGI bin, CGI dash bin folder. Uh, and also you may be asking yourself, let me go inside my CGI bin folder here. I'll create a new uh, file. I'll call it um, who dot, I don't even have to put a dot. I can just say who again, the extension doesn't matter. And I'll say this is a bin bash script. And I'll just say, uname dash a save that again I have to make it executable or it will not run and you also want to uh, consider permissions to write to stuff you want to make sure that not everyone has permission to write to script files or even that folder because if someone somehow sees a flaw in one of your scripts to where it can redirect it and write a new file to your CGI bin uh, well it can create a new script uh, that has the permissions as you're about to see. Um, see, I in again. We call that who with no extension. We'll hit enter. And oh, <laughs> I forgot something. You can see there's no output, even if I control you to look at the, uh, the, the source code there, because we forgot our content type. Remember, if we uh, cat out one of our hello dot sh files you can see remember don't forget this I do that quite often if you get no output remember to have those lines so we'll say content type text.html or text slash html then a blank line and then our command which can be anything we want we'll hit f5 up here to refresh and you can see that uh, all the information about my uh, my server here and also actually that's about my server. I want to know about myself. So let me go back into my file here and I'll echo out a line break. And then I'll just say, who am I? Save that, refresh it. And you can see it's running as MLX1000. That's another thing to keep in mind that these scripts are running as whatever user you start the server as. So if you start the server as root, these scripts are going to run as root. If you start them as 
uh, regular user, it's going to have the permissions of that regular user, meaning those scripts can modify any scripts that user can run. So, so right now, you know, if I write a script, it can modify anything in my home directory, in the temp directory. Hopefully, my regular user doesn't have permission outside of my home directory besides the temp directory. Um, so keep that in mind. You may want to create especially there's probably already a user on your system uh, called well I don't know if it's by default I know once you install something like Apache it's there uh, but a www data uh, user uh, that you may want to start your scripts as that user uh, limiting their permissions unless maybe you're making a program that you want to be able to access an interface with certain users files uh, maybe you're making some sort of media center and you want to be able to have permissions to to start up mplayer because uh, a regular you know uh, web user shouldn't have permission to interface with your GUI um, so all depending on what you're doing just trying to bring that up to keep it in mind security is important whenever you're doing server-side scripts um, and especially you know you're opening this up to people on your network uh, so so password protect stuff, be sure you have the right permissions uh, on certain scripts and on certain folders. You don't want someone overwriting a script file with their own information that's going to be doing nasty stuff. That's just a little word of advice. Again, thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There should be a link in the description. I hope you're enjoying this series on servers and networks. And, uh, of course, next week we'll be continuing with a very basic look at another web server using Netcat, uh, which uh, you've probably seen before, but I'm going to take it a step further than most people will show you. So I hope you look forward to that. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, this is an introduction to FilmsByChris.com. I'm Chris, that's Chris the K. That's me right there. My daughter Ember, and my wife Jennifer. We pretty much live in the swamps of Florida. I'm a firefighter by day, as well as by night. We work long hours. But that's not why you're here. You're here about the videos I put up on YouTube. These videos are mainly about computers and programming, which means most of my videos look something like this. And if that's what you're interested in, great. If not, that's all right. I do videos on other topics too, such as video editing, special effects, photo editing, 3D design, and music creation. If you are one of my viewers and you enjoy my videos, my Patreon page is a place where you can go to help support my videos. So I ask that you take the time to go to my Patreon page and look at the different levels of rewards you can receive for different levels of backing. There should be a link in the description of this video if you are watching it on YouTube. Otherwise, you can visit patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. And I thank you for your time and your support. Have a great day. This month on Films by Chris, we're looking at networks and servers. And although I'm going to go over everything I talk about in this video in more detail in future videos, this first video is just to give you a taste and go over some basic tools we're going to be using in the coming weeks. So we're going to be looking at setting up web servers. Now, uh, if you're going to be really setting up a web server, I suggest using something like Apache. That's what I normally use, but there's a bunch of other web servers out there. But there are some tools that are probably already on your system that will let you set up a simple web server, quick and easy, regardless of what version of Linux you're running. I'm going to talk about three tools a day, and they're on almost every Linux system out there. Uh, two of them will probably be on even small things like routers and other small devices. So first, let's look at HTTPD from BusyBox. BusyBox is a great tool that is on every version of Linux you'll come across, uh, including Android phones, routers, and even, you know, if you can get into the uh, console on something like a TV or other type of device, 
chances are BusyBox is going to be there and it's going to be the shell that's going to be being used. Now, although BusyBox can be compiled with different components, if you have a full version of BusyBox, it has a bunch of built-in tools, tools that you're used to having in the shell, all built already into BusyBox. What you need to do is first open up your shell and type in BusyBox. This will give you a list of all commands that are available for your version of BusyBox. And if you're lucky, somewhere in that list, which is alphabetical, you should find one that says HTTPD. If that's available, then you're all set for setting up a web server. All you have to do now is type in BusyBox, HTTPD, space dash p and the port number you want to start a web server on this is the very basic function here and although there are some restrictions on many systems as far as what ports you can use if you're not root user if you're a standard user you should be able to use uh, many of the higher ports that are available so you can type this command out and right away it will turn the folder that you're in into the main folder the root folder for your web server now, be advised this is not going to be creating a directory list for you. It's not going to be giving you a list of all the files and folders in that directory. But if you type in the name of the file in the URL, you can guide yourself to it. And of course, if you guide yourself to an HTML file, it will display that web file just like any other web server. There are many other functions of this HTTPD in BusyBox, but we'll go over that in a future video. Next up is Python. Python comes with built-in options for a very simple web server. The command is, as you can see at the bottom of the screen here, for basic functionality. And unlike the HTTPD in BusyBox, this will generate a directory list for you. So if you quickly want to share files and folders from your computer as a web server and offer up HTML files, as a web server, you can use Python with this command and it will start up in the current directory and you can access it uh, by going into your web browser, typing in your IP address and the port number that you started on. It has other functionality that we'll look at in a future video, but this is another great option. And although lighter systems such as routers and phones may not have Python built in by default, Pretty much every laptop and desktop Linux system will most likely have Python installed already. Lastly is a tool that is known as the Networking Swiss Army Knife, Netcat, also known as NC. Now, Netcat is a Networking Swiss Army Knife of tools for network use and can do crazy things if you know what commands to use. It can also be used as a very, very basic HTML server web server for loading up files. Now, it's definitely not nearly as powerful as the two that I previously talked about, but in a pinch, you can use Netcat to serve up files and HTML files, images, and other stuff to a web browser. It's very, very basic, but can be very useful. And although you may not have a full version of Netcat already installed on your system, chances are, as I said earlier, you have BusyBox built in. And BusyBox, in many cases, will have Netcat built into it. And although it's a slimmed down version of Netcat, uh, you will still have Netcat available. So again, on smaller devices uh, that have BusyBox installed as their main shell, as routers or phones and other devices, Netcat is available. And to serve up a simple HTML file, you can serve it up using this command here. And again, we'll look at that a little bit more in the future and how to make it a little more advanced and allow multiple connections because this particular command right here, once connected, Netcat will finish out and you won't be able to connect again. So it's like a one-time service unless you put it into a loop of some sort. So we'll be looking at that more in coming weeks. So again, these are basic options for setting up some very basic web servers. And although they are not full featured web servers such as Apache, they have many uses and chances are they are already on your Linux system. So I thank you for watching. I hope you subscribe so you don't miss the future videos. And as always, I hope that you have a great day and I hope that you visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description. And as always, have a great day.
Okay, today we're going to be looking at setting up a web server uh, very quickly with Python. Just default Python, what comes with Python. So if you have Python on your system, you should be good to go for setting up a quick web server. And uh, this first part, you, you've probably seen uh, before if you've ever Googled Python web server. It's the first thing that comes up. It's a simple HTTP server. Um, so we're going to run Python. Say dash M, we're going to say simple, and this is case sensitive, HTTP server so capital S capital HTTP capital S and then whatever port you want to run it on so we'll say 800 here uh, and I'll hit enter and it says serving HTTP on 0000, 000 port 80 or sorry 8000 now here's my web browser let me refresh and look you can see there are two files now one of the advantages to this over the default setup for um, BusyBox HTTPD, which we've gone over previous weeks, is that if there's no index file, it is going to create a uh, index file for you, a directory list for you. So you can see there's two files in the current directory, which by the way, when I start up this script, it is running uh, using the current folder. So I'm going to want to run this in the folder I want. And here's an example. Here's a picture I can click on, and there's a, just a little civil PNG I threw in there that says filmsbychris.com, which is a great website. You should visit it. And I can go back. Now, uh, let me control C a couple times down here in our uh, shell window and kill that server. So now, if I come back up here and hit F5 to refresh, you can see web, uh, the web, this web page is not available because we shut down the server. So let's create a, uh, a HTML file. So I'm going to vim and I'll call it hello.html. And in here, we'll create a very simple hello people yeah, forward slash one. So just giving it some header tags there. Um, and now we'll start up our server again, hit F5. And now you can see that that file is there. And if I click on it, it displays it with the bold text because it's, it's reading it as an HTML file. Now, if I was to, again, kill our server here and move our hello HTML to be called index.html and I was to go back here uh, it's still showing it when I hit back page even though the server's down just because it's cached in the web browser if I hit F5 at this point you can see that the web server is down I'm going to start it up again running the same command python-m uh, simple HTTP server on port 80 and uh, as you can see, my web browser automatically updated once it realized the server was up and it says hello people. The reason for that is if there's an index.html file, it's going to default to that rather than the directory list. So now I can't view that list of files. If I know the, um, the, the name of one of those files, I can say forward slash, um, what did I name that, that image file? Well, let's... Uh, Let's list here. Oh, that's right. FBK for Films by Chris. PNG. So even though I can't get the directory list, I can say FBK.png and still view that file. But again, if I go back to just localhost uh, 8000 here and hit enter, it defaults to that index file. Also, I'm doing localhost because I'm connecting back to myself. Other options, since I'm connecting back to myself, can be um, 127.0.0.1 which is the same as, in most cases, is doing uh, um, localhost. So you can see that runs the same. Another option would be my current IP address on my local network if someone else on the local network wants to connect. Now, if you're at a remote location, you're going to have to set up uh, port forwarding on your router uh, to access it. But locally, I can say um, 192.168.1.150 8,000 again because that's the I know that's the IP address of my system and that will work and another thing uh, if I kill here this should work uh, you can see the name of my host right here is grml I should be able to type in grml dot local colon 8,000 hit enter and that didn't work just because I killed the server down here. So let's go ahead, restart the server, and then refresh our page up here, and you can see it works. 
Uh, and so as long as your network's set up this way, and most networks will do this, and your computer's set up the right way, and your browser knows how to resolve names, uh, you can use grml.localhost. Uh, and again, grml is the name of my host on my system here. So when you're in your shell, whatever's past your at symbol, you should be able to access that computer while you're on that local network by using grml.local or that name and dot local and the port name there. So that's, that's a few options there. But now let's say I want to only be able to have a loopback connection. Loopback connection means, well, let me kill our server here. Let me maximize the screen here, clear it. If I type in if config, you can see I have three network cards. I got my wired ethernet card, you have a LAN card, and you also have this loopback device. This loopback connection is a virtual network device. You can have no other network cards in this and you can have a loopback device and that just allows your computer to connect to itself without sending anything out through the network. Um, and you can use this uh, in many cases, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to see applications using this to allow a program to use uh, network services uh, without having to go out to the network. Um, and that way you can avoid, you know, one, other people connecting to those services and also prevent uh, ports or um, network sniffing from other devices. Obviously, if someone's sniffing on this device and they're sniffing that device, there's not much you can do about it. Um, you have many problems then. Um, but let's say you, you wanted to set up a web interface um, with maybe a form to fill out that saves stuff to a database and you want to use uh, web services but you only want this computer to be able to connect to it, you can use a loopback device. So how can you use this Python uh, example to only access through loopback? Well, uh, you're going to have to write a little script. It's a simple little script. Uh, you can Google this. I've made it as simple as possible and I've put it on here. Uh, I've called it server PY. Uh, and first line always with any script, um, you're going to want to use your shebang line to tell your computer what interpreter to use. If you're having issues and you come and ask me, can you look at my code and you don't have that, I'm going to yell at you. I don't care. Do people write it different ways and, I, and, and, and you can have different opinions on how you write it, but make sure you have that shebang line saying this is a Python script. Okay, next we're going to import a few modules, our sys module, and, um, and actually we don't need that sys module. That was from something, uh, originally I was writing this and you could pass arguments to it. I decided not to do that because I decided to keep the script as simple as possible. So I don't think we need that sys module. So the only module we need to import is base HTTP server. And from that, we're going to use the simple HTTP server, which is what we were just using. And we're going to, uh, and from that, we're going to import this handler request. Now we're going to set a object, a simple HTTP request handler and set our server object to base uh, HTTP server and dot uh, HTTP server. And we're going to use those further down here. Next, we're going to create a variable that contains uh, two bits of information, the IP address and the port. And since we're using this loop back IP address, uh, it will be able to loop back but not use those external IP addresses uh, that they're connected to other network cards. Uh, next, what type of protocol uh, version are we going to use? We're going to use HTTP 1. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to create this HTTP object. It's going to be a server using, see, this object up here. We're going to pass it some information, the server ad address, which we've created up here with the port. And we're going to say, use this handler. Which handler? Well, this one right up here that we imported up here. We imported it up here. We used it up here. In fact, you can actually put this right in here. But it's just shortening it here because we write it here and there. Anyway. Um, and then this line here just says, continue forever. Otherwise, the script would run and close and no one would be able to connect. This says, as long as the script is running, keep this process, run process running. So let me save that. You'll want to make it executable, change mod, server.py, or whatever you call it, and we'll run it. I didn't set it to give any output by default when you start it up. Uh, you can do that if you'd like. Now, if I hit F5 up here, or hit enter, you can see web page not available. If I use the uh, GRML localhost, 
if I try 192.168.1.150 port 8000, same thing. But because those are using, uh, in this case, my ETHO card, because that's what I'm connected to the regular network with. So it's using my actual network card. But if I was to do localhost, that works. And if I was to 127.0.0.1, uh, .1, that also works. So that will prevent anyone else on the network from being able to access the server. The only people that can access the server are the people that are on this machine. Uh, yes, you can tunnel through with SSH, but then you're doing that on purpose. Um, so yes, you can create applications and you can uh, set them up so that only this computer has access to them. Now if I was to kill this, and let's remove that index.html and start that server up again, and refresh up here, we're back to our directory list. Again, you can see we have our image file here, and we also have this server py file, which is the, the, the process we're running here. Uh, if I was to click on that, you can see it displays it, it doesn't run it. So can you create scripts that will run on the server side using Python? The answer is yes, and that's what we're going to be looking into next week. Setting it up basically the same type of service, but allowing scripts to run on the server end. And that will definitely help you if you're creating applications um, and you want to be able to do more advanced stuff. You're going to want stuff to run on the server end. And we'll go over that next week. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you continue uh, watching this series. I hope you subscribe. Uh, if you like these videos, be sure to like them, give them a thumbs up, and be sure to share them. Uh, it really helps me when you share your videos, gets me more viewers, gets more interaction from people. So if you enjoy these, you know, and you want to share them, please do so. And I'll, I'll, as always, visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There should be a link in the description. And as always, have a great day. We've been looking at networks and servers, and so far we've looked at BusyBox, uh, HTTPD, we looked at uh, creating our own access point uh, with a computer and a Wi-Fi card. We've also looked at using Python to not only set up a web server, but set up a web server that you have server-side scripts on. Now we're looking at a very, very, very simple way to create a very, very simple web server. This is something you probably use in a pinch, you wouldn't use actually as a web server. And it's probably something that uh, you may have seen before, it's very commonly used, but I'm going to take it a step further than most most examples do. It's going to be using Netcat, uh, which you can install on your system. There's also a very basic version of it built into most versions of BusyBox. It's a little more simple than, uh, it's not a full featured one, but it's there. And um, it allows you to basically pipe a file or the output of some sort of program into, uh, as output for a web device. Um, but lots of times, well, it, it it's basically that one file. It, it pipes over into your web display, your web browser. And to access other files, like let's say you want to have a web page with images in it, is a little more, well, that's what we're going to look at after we look at the basics here. So, here we go. Let me make my font a little bit bigger here. And we'll bring this down here. So here we have a web browser. I set up, I already pointed it to my computer here. Again, uh, this is on my local network. I know my IP address. And I'm going to start the server on port 800 because I know a regular user can use that port. Where port 80 usually you need more permissions to. So whatever permissions your user has. And uh, what I'm going to type here is I'm going to say NC or you can type out netcat. Either should work. Uh, dash I. And of course you need netcat installed. So install that through your repositories. Um, and I'm going to say, so dash L means listen, dash P means port, I'm going to say 8000. And uh, then I'm also going to say dash Q1, that one's kind of optional, basically that's what I'm saying is, after a second, quit, kill the connection, because it shouldn't take more to, to pipe out this simple display, and you don't want the connection to stay open for some reason, so this will be like, hey, after a second, you know, quit, if, if things aren't going right. Okay, so we did that, and that will listen on a port, but not much is going to happen at this point because we need to give it some sort of information. So let's go ahead, and uh, I'm going to split the screen here, and I'm going to create a new web page. I'm going to say vim 
uh, embed dot html. Well, no, I'll just call this nc dot html. And in here, I'll just say h1 hello from netcat. I will save that file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, take my nc.html file, and that's going to be the output. So with this web server, you're not going to be able to like direct it to certain files. Someone connects on this port, they're going to get the output of this file no matter what else they type in. So here we go. I'm going to hit Enter to start that up. Up here, I've already got the IP address and the port number put in. And I'm going to hit Enter. And you can see, hello from Netcat. Now, if I come up here and I hit Refresh, uh, we get web page not available again, uh, not available. And if someone else tries to connect, they're going to get the same thing. Because as you can see down here, our server is no longer running. Um, oops. Ah. It's, there we go. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Uh, so we need to put our, our netcat into loop. And there's different versions of netcat out there. I've seen some commands that are supposed to do this built into netcat and they don't always work so I'm going to show you uh, another way to do it. We're going to say while true so we're just going to create a while loop in our shell here do and then we'll say netcat dash l for listen dash p for port 8000 in this case dash q1 and we'll pipe in our uh, nc file our netcat file our html file and we'll say done. What it's going to do is we're going to run that and up here, I'll hit F5. And as you can see, it says, hello from Netcat. We get some output that our browser actually sent to Netcat. And you can see that it's still running. So I can hit F5 again and F5 again. And someone else can connect. Basically, it's going to Netcat sitting there waiting. It's listening. When someone connects, it gives that information. Netcat stops running, but our while loop starts it up again. So that's, that's one way to do it. Again, this is not something you want to do for a commercial website. This is something you do in a pinch. OK, so, so that's working great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and control C does not seem to want to stop that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close that shell. So that's, that's normally how I kill that. You could also, I guess, use, uh, you know, the kill command to kill the process. Uh, okay. So we've done that. If I, again, up here, refresh our servers down, what happens if we want to display an image out to the web server? Well, we can do that as well. So let's go ahead and just again, netcat dash listen dash port. 8000 Q1, and we'll redirect. I have in this folder fbk.png. It's the films by Chris, just basic PNG. I'll hit enter. The server's against listening. I didn't put it in the while loop just so I don't have to kill the shell each time here. Uh, but I'm going to come up here, and again, I don't have to put in any file name because no matter what file name I put in there, it's just going to output the same output on that port no matter what. Well, my browser just automatically refreshed because it realized the server was back up. But you can see it displayed www.filmsbychris.com. It's a PNG file. It's basically just outputted that file. So that's one way you can share images. But how can you put an image into a web page? So normally, if we go back into our uh, netcat HTML here, I could do something like this. Uh, I can say, well, we'll put it on. Well, I don't need to line break. Those are header files. Okay. Anyway, I can say img source equals and um, films by Chris. Oops, what am I doing? Films by Chris. Png is the name of the file inside the folder we're at, and that on a regular web page would work. Let's go ahead and save that, close that, run our server again here, and up here hit F5. And that's because I typed in the wrong command down here. I piped out the image again. We want to pipe out nc.html. Now we run it, refresh up here, and you can see it says, hello from Netcat, but our image is broke because Netcat doesn't know how to serve up files other than the one we're redirecting into it with the less than symbol. So how can we get a web page with images and other data in there when we're only able to pipe in this one file? Well. You may or may not know this, but you can embed images into an HTML file. So instead of having an HTML file and your images separate, you can have them all built into the HTML file themselves in a plain text using Base64. I'm not going to get into too much about Base64 today. Base64 is a great, great thing. It takes any binary file you have and will convert it to plain text ASCII so you can transmit stuff. If you ever looked at 
uh, the raw data from a an email. If there's a, a, a attachment, the attachment is sent to your email program in uh, Base64. So what we have to do is we have to generate Base64 data for our image. So uh, first things first, let's go into our netcat.html file. And here, instead of saying the name of the file, because again, netcat doesn't know what to do with that is going, oh, you're looking for this. I don't know how to serve that up because by the time it even looks at that, once it sends the one file, uh, netcat closes. So we're going to say data colon image forward slash PNG. This is saying, okay, the source of this image is going to be a data. It's going to be an image. It's going to be a PNG, PNG image in this case, semicolon, and, and we're going to say base 64. We're telling it, okay, use base 64, comma. Now we need to put the base 64 information, which is going to be really, really long. Probably on your system array, you have base 64 installed. If you type base 64 and the name of a file, in this case, goes by chris.png, fbk.png, we hit enter. You can see it outputs all this plain text. That is the image changed from a binary file into a plain ASCII text, uh, which characters are readable to us, but obviously it's we can't view that image, look at that and go, oh, that's an image of this. Um, so we're going to copy and paste. That's kind of long for me to highlight it all. So I have XClip installed. Uh, if you don't, it's in your repositories. Basically, that's going to pipe that into my clipboard. Uh, so boom, right now I can go and now I can go and paste that into my, you can also redirect it into a file if you want and then use that. Anyway, I'm going to go into my, my HTML file here, hit I, I'm going to center click here and give it a second. <laughs> Vim is going, oh, okay, that's a lot of data. Let's, let's put all that here. It's going to take a couple of seconds because it's an image. There we go. It's all in there. I can now save that. Hit up arrow a few times. So now we're going to run our command again. Netcat, listen, port 8000, quit after one second, redirect this image or this HTML file, which has the image built into it. Run that, refresh up here, and there we go. We have our HTML content and the image. And of course, you can do this throughout the page. Now, remember, now that HTML file that used to be the small little text file is now rather large. If we actually list out all the files in this directory, you can see that our uh, filmsbychris.png is 57 kilobytes, not that big. Our HTML file is uh, 76 kilobytes. And um, part of that is because there is more data in there, but also uh, base64 tends to be a little bit larger than the original little uh, binary file. Um, but keep that in mind, if you're putting large images in there, it's, your HTML file is going to get rather large. It's going to take longer to pipe it. But, and, um, but that is it. And, and in fact, if I was to open up in my web browser here, I'm using Chrome, I'll hit F12 to bring up my little console here, and I look at network. On a regular web page, if, um, let's go ahead and start our server up, and up here I'll hit F5 to refresh. You can see it, it shows right here. It doesn't say a file name, it's saying, okay, it's transferring this data as an image. And uh, so keep that in mind, it's not getting it from a separate file, it's actually embedded in an HTML file. And in most cases, web servers, websites, you, you don't wanna do that. But if you ever needed, to, that's an extra little bonus tip outside of this Netcat tutorial, you could send an HTML file to somebody as a single file with images if you ever wanted to. I've never done that, but you can. <laughs> so that is it. A uh, little quick look at base64 there, which is a great thing used a lot, especially with HTML5 for storing images created on canvas and stuff like that. Not getting into that today, but um, I hope that you learned something because again, this, this using Netcat as a web server is a fairly common hack <laughs> that people use to get a web server to share a file real quick. As you saw, you can share a uh, a file by piping the file or the HTML. Um, but at the same time, I thought I'd take it a step further in case you've already seen that and show you how you can embed those images in there. So you can have a full web page if you wanted with images and, and other data built in using Base64. So as always, uh, I hope that you enjoy this tutorial. Please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There should be a link in the description. If you like this video, let me know by one, giving this video a thumbs up. 
two, commenting below and let me know that you like it so that I know what topics people like and I know to do more. Uh, and also, uh, it helps me out a lot if you share these videos, uh, you know, wherever, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, share it, get me more viewers. I really appreciate that. You know, also, if you want to support me, you can support me at patreon.com forward slash metal x1000. Uh, I appreciate that. But if you can't afford to do that or for some reason you don't want to do that, you can help me by sharing this video. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. If you enjoy my tutorials and would like to see more, please think about contributing to my Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash metalx1000.